Howdy. Greetings. It's quite the game collection behind you. See Settlers. Yeah. See a couple others I know. Looks like fun. If only I had time to play them. That's the problem. Sure, yeah. I also just... a Generations poster. I think we would get along. Yes, yes, we would get along. There's also a uh, Spaceship Discovery there and the Lego Gemini 5 there. Well played, and... sir. I, I see the captain's hat on top of the mini fridge. I'm questioning that one. Oh, that's a Marine Corps hat. That was my uh, that was my cover from when I was in the Marines. Makes sense. It's on top of the uh, beer containment unit. That seems appropriate. The desk rum unit. <laughs> hey everyone. Good morning. Emily, I just want to let you know they were all brutal with me last week when I was trying to lead this meeting. Just real rough with me. Just want to get that out there. Especially Chase. Aww. Just, just kidding. Just kidding. Bro. She knows that's untrue. You, you've just revealed yourself. <laughs> that, that was my tell. A quick reminder for everybody joining us. Uh, the agenda is linked in the chat. Please be sure to add yourself in the attendance. If you have any updates, please put them in parentheses after your name. If otherwise, just put no update. If you're a new member, go ahead and put new and we'd like to have you introduce yourself. Gonna give everybody a couple more minutes. I will also need two volunteers as scribes. I have a question on the scribe thing. Is the is the expectation that it's a kind of word for word, note for note, or is it really just minute minute notes? Or it's we don't want you to do a transcript uh, that will kill your fingers. We also have a transcript service of the recording, so we definitely don't need folks to type it out. So really, it's uh, high level notes um, of what was discussed and kind of decisions that are going on. Okay, fair. That's kind of what I had defaulted to, but I didn't know if, if I was being a rebel or, no. or in line. I believe we had that updated in the role in the repo when we defined what a scribe does. In my, could, one yeah. of my first times, I was like, what is the expectation? I like took down every single thing. <laughs> I was like typing real fast. <laughs> you weren't the only one. I did it too. I think I got yeah. word for word on my first couple of meetings as a scribe. All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. So uh, quick reminder to everyone, this meeting is being recorded and posted to YouTube shortly thereafter. Your participation in these meetings is an agreement to abide by the SIG Security Code of Conduct, which can be located in our repository. All right. Um, Pushkar, you've got an update for issue 480. I'll let you go yeah. first. Yes, so some of the folks from last meeting might remember uh, we, it's almost now a month since we uh, public, published the security white paper uh, version one. So obviously we have gotten good feedback so far. We made some minor updates, etc. There is a readme APR also in works. What I was wondering is uh, if any of the folks who have read it or who have uh, shared it with their uh, colleagues uh, wanted to create a process working with everyone that would allow us to have a good set of retrospective uh, for every version that we will publish. 
uh, and I've created a P issue on GitHub for it, just pasting the link. So the I the only ask from uh, to ask rather from every one of you is if you have any feedback in terms of how could we build the process, uh, please add a comment to the GitHub issue. Uh, and the second one is uh, potentially I'm thinking uh, Emily open for feedback. Similar to the white paper uh, meetings, we could have a couple of meetings at least in the new years after the holidays, uh, just before this six security meeting uh, and kind of discuss with the folks who are interested in working together on this. So if you want to work with me on this, uh, DM me your email address so I can send a Zoom. And then after that, we can set up something once everyone is back from holidays. Yeah, and comment on the ticket as well for that. And Pushkar, there is a PR out, um, if number four seventy seven, about yes. um, maintenance of the white paper and what that process looks like from updating the documentation within the repository. So if you could take a look at that. So yep, I had a yep. question, if I may. So um, can, can you please clarify what is the objective? I'm not sure I got the complete essence of it. So is it just working on updates or what, what exactly is the objective here? Yeah, it's kind of similar to how in Agile, after a sprint, we kind of do retrospective of how what worked well, what could be better. Uh, and then based on the feedback that we receive from everyone who were contributors as well as who are consumers of the white paper, we will get some ideas for what the next version should look like. Do we need to change a few things? Uh, like, do we need to reduce the content or was there something that was missing or something that people thought would be useful to add more details about? Uh, and those kind of ideas, we can put it together uh, as uh, the first retrospective of version one. And then uh, while we are doing this, we build a process for how to do the same kind of retrospective for future versions. Okay, thank you, Pushkar. So I think there are uh, if, uh, two aspects to this, if I understand it right. One is how could, uh, because for a lot of us who contributed to this, how could we make that process better? Mm -hmm. And second is from a content perspective. I think we should keep those two distinct as we proceed through this, I feel. Yeah, that, I think that's a fair point. Uh, we can do that. Uh, what I want to kind of see is give a voice more importantly to the silent uh, voice in a way who are not really in the group today that we discuss uh, every day or every week with but mostly are like end user consumers who read the paper but have some thoughts and we haven't had a chance to listen from them so yeah. from cncf's help maybe with the marketing team if we could get some kind of a survey out as well is what i was wondering would be maybe a good idea and I think from that perspective, I also feel like we need to give it, this is like brand spanking new, right? I don't even think like, even yesterday I did a webinar uh, on Linux Foundation where I amplified that message. So I think all of us need to ensure that this is amplified even more, which is where I opened another ticket where we should do a webinar to really get the message out before we are able to bring in that feedback so that give a little bit more time for people to actually consume uh, all the content there and uh, and so that we can feed it into the process that you're suggesting. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And maybe the webinars would become another data source for feedback, where after the webinar, people will read it and give feedback or to ask questions, which would help us in retrospective. So yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Awesome. Okay. Sounds like you guys are moving forward and that's great. Sounds uh, like go ahead. It sounds so grown up. <laughs> I know, right? Um, all right, so it looks like we have a new member and I apologize if I do not pronounce your name correctly, Fasal. Yep, um, so hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are. My name is Fasal Razak and uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm a new member here. And uh, just to give some introduction about my background, um, I, I'm basically a software engineer, and I also have a PhD degree in automation systems from Turin, Italy. Uh, currently, I am in Toronto, Canada, and I work for a cybersecurity vendor in the United States. 
um, and basically my, I deal with machine identity management. I'm a lead cloud security analyst there. Um, basically, I, uh, my main role these days is that I go to different customer sites and I analyze their environments, their infrastructures, and then I basically make recommendations to them uh, regarding how they can manage their machine identities. Uh, my introduction to this forum was that I read the security paper that came out, the white paper that you guys wrote. And well, I basically read the paper and, and I deal with the customers as well. So I have some background in that uh, uh, information as well. Uh, I want, I actually joined this group because I wanted to see a couple of things added more to that security paper regarding machine identities as well. And also how people are doing their uh, CI CD pipelines actually right now in, in, uh, in at different customer sites. So I wanted to bring that knowledge here and probably in the next version, or if not a next version, something else in the future, I would want to see a few things um, kind of changed. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's why I'm here and let's see how it goes. Well, awesome to have you join us today. Yep, All right. Thank you. And then next up, I'm sure like we all want to talk about solar winds and what happened there. But before we get into that lovely conversation that I believe Mark would like to kind of drive, um, we have an announcement. So for those of you that are new or some of you that have been around for a while, typically our SIG has technical leads that are, they kind of drive a lot of the direction um, with the co-chairs and help initiate some of the activities and make sure the SIG is moving in the right direction. Um, I used to be a technical lead. I'm now a co-chair. Brandon Lum is a technical lead, as is Justin Capos. So um, given that I am no longer a technical lead and the community is growing very quickly, getting larger. We've got lots of really awesome projects that we wanna have upcoming. Um, the co-chairs have nominated to our talk liaisons, our new technical leads. Um, so I would like to kind of welcome Aradna, Ash, and Andres as the new technical leads for SIG Security, joining Justin Capos and Brandon Lum. Uh, they, they have to be voted by the CNCFTSE first. So yes. we're, we're just going to open the voting, but um, we agreed to do that today. Yeah. Yes. So hopefully we should be able to get this um, all approved by January. Yes. We're very excited about it. So who's the third person there? Andres Vega. Okay. Um, Congrats. Next up, uh, let's talk about solar winds. Mark, do you want to kind of start that? Well, sure. This is, it's early. Maybe it could be argued this is too soon to talk about it, but I think it's a great use case for the, the problem of securing the supply chain and you know, the update framework is something that a number of us have hoped to either be using or have uh, talked to the developers uh, and participants in that project. You know, it's a CNCF project. Uh, it's, you could argue, you know, a central piece of securing software in, uh, in the foundation to be able to secure the flight, the supply chain. The other thing is that, you know, from my point of view, we tend to attract a, and uh, this is self-congratulatory, but we we attract a pretty high level of uh, competence in this group and in others. And what that means from a attack surface point of view, to use the, the MITRE terminology, that uh, smart people can put smart bugs into software that you know end up being uh, compromises of both, uh, not just the the tool in the case of solar winds here, but the whole institution in which we're trying to stay engaged, you know, building frameworks to build secure software, it calls the whole thing into question. So the, you know, the, the mechanics of how this happens get diluted as it bleeds out into the public space and becomes a, you know, both a slam against the cloud platform in general, 
against self-regulated institutions like this one. Uh, and I think about crowdsourced software kind of writ large into that, that space. So, uh, you know, I have some views about this, but I really just wanted to open the floor to what our thoughts about this might be. You know, what are we doing the best we can do? Um, you know, is this the case of, you know, lightweight adoption by commercial entities to things we're already doing well? Uh, is it, um, you know, weak socialization of best practices that we think people have already adopted? Or is this really just the, you know, reality we haven't come to terms with that undermining the tools is really the most uh, sophisticated and best attack surface that we should have been ready for this? It's, it's lovely, I think, to imagine that we should have been ready first. I think we all knew about it coming. Um, I think we're all humans, we're all lazy, right? Um, I, I found an example somewhere recently where someone was, they didn't want to wait for a pull request to be merged into a project. So they forked it, they did a build, and then they included that binary in their Docker image. Right. And we're going to get rid of it in two weeks because it's just a temporary thing. And that was four months ago. So it's, 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 it's going to be ongoing. It's, I think it comes down to how can we make the security as easy as possible for folks to use um, so that they don't roll eyes when we ask them to adopt it. Yeah. I mean, there is a, one of the, I don't know, weaknesses that I see here is a kind of an instinctive preference for vulnerability scanning as the security framework. Uh, you know, this, it should have been a lesson when the ACES update thing happened. Uh, I think that was uh, early in 2019. There's probably some others before that, but it's very hard to get away from that, especially if you have siloed teams in your enterprise that who do nothing but that. And that is a, you know, that's a busy making enterprise trying to keep up with that. And it's not just a case of patching everything, right? It's a risk rated gradation of things. That's a non-trivial effort. Uh, we have to acknowledge that that's the reality of it. But I do think there's a tendency to say, well, I passed the scans, it must be okay. And then there's the other thing that we deal with in finance is uh, how do you vet your third party software in general? Your third party contractors, partners, even some of your customers, you know, maybe suppliers indirectly to you or exposed platforms and you have, you know, semi federated trust or maybe even more tightly federated trust um, that you are assuming is in place, but you really can't do assurance testing on any of that. I think part of the problem is, is that, right, you're talking about the problem where how do you I trust the software vendor that they implemented a process the way that I want them to, right? And when all I get out of that process is a signed image where their PKI probably was exposed on an FTP server for two years, right? Um, so I think being able to bubble up that metadata that went into the build process uh, in a standardized way is going to be the way forward. Um, and that's where I think this community can help out is what does that standard look like? And how do we distribute that among the enterprises? How do we contribute to that? Is it, what does the scope of it look like, right? What is the minimal scope and what, what would an ideal system look like? But that's just the tip of an iceberg, right? So we, we're trying to do like, I think it's happens every year, more or less, uh, loudly in the press, depends on uh, uh, how many and how big companies it's been involved into accident. But this is just like prevention of this and securing software supply chain against such compromises is just like a prevention tactics, but we should think about like defense and depth, like, presume that this is happens already or happening in your system, how would you be able to detect and find it, right? Uh, I think so. There, there should be strategies like an assumption should be that this has happened. So if it happens, how would you know about it? I think part of the challenge has been that historically we've relied uh, on self-attestation for these kinds of things to, suggest that the supply chain is secure. Uh, so we've seen some movement, for example, with CMMC to go in and to try to bring some auditability into this and some uh, third party ways of attesting. 
I think if there is a way to automate some of that, uh, can probably reduce some of the cost and the load. Um, but that would imply an integration of the supply chain. And some of the work that I'm doing with, uh, with some other standards groups is trying to tackle this kind of a problem. Uh, so I'm sure folks in this group are aware of, of some of those activities, but uh, we have to pick and choose I think where we think we can play a role in this, uh, we, we can't boil the ocean on this. Um, it's, it's a big problem. If we can automate key parts of this, uh, I think would be a, at least a step forward. Thanks. And there, there have been um, enough problems, I think recently in a, in a CICD and a few guys subscribe to any, any channels where you get a like vulnerabilities, I think lots of them come in in uh, different CI/CD systems and a plugin. So um, a good point that I've seen, I don't remember, it's been on Twitter or like through internal discussions related to this, but there is a feeling that we do a pretty good job or like decent on a product security side. So it's pretty hard to get access or compromise systems through this, but CICD historically been something that's sitting somewhere and bootstrapping all our systems, but we paid less attention to uh, the security of the systems as well. And then that got an easy target nowadays for uh, bad guys that's trying to get into our system. So uh, maybe spending more attention for uh, and cycles for securing CICD systems as well as internal is also a good just, idea. Just pulling on that, if we can make the economics of this work, just again, the, the issue here should be that it can't be prohibitively expensive for the supply chain members to participate in this, like a really low key, like, you know, somehow there's gotta be a way to automate this is, is kind of what I'm coming to, I think. Can I ask a question of the group, maybe? Um, I'm sure everybody probably knows FAIR and does some amount of, or attempts to quantify risk, right? For prioritization, budget allocation, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, kind of some of the interesting thing here for me is when you, when your uh, crown jewels are not necessarily financial, right? Like if you are the cornerstone of civic responsibility, then how do you, quantify that in a fair like system right how do you how does that work if everything is meant to boil down to dollars you know i've had the same thing where i worked at a, a nonprofit where we did a, a significant amount of human rights and activist work and um you know the the push and pull there on what you could and couldn't do and who you couldn't couldn't protect and, and what you could and couldn't guarantee was it was pretty exhausting but a lot of our models on where and when to spend money come down to, you. we can do it so well. And after that, there's insurance, but not everything is recoverable, right? If it's not financial, it's not recoverable. So, you know, the whole idea of security being a part of the risk management space. And it seems like that requires some acknowledgement that like, we don't have all the answers and we don't necessarily know what are the most valuable things to protect always, which is clearly the thing that you need to know to start. So I don't know, that was a long ramble, but that's where I'm at with it. But I, I think there's points there though, right? It's so the first thing, I think when the comment was around cost of making this cheap for people to secure, I don't think they're talking about a dollar cost. There, there's all sorts of different aspects of that. But, um, oh, I lost my thought. Uh, let's see where you're going with, oh yeah, no. This, I don't think CNCF wants to get into risk management. So I think that that's, I, I hear what you're saying there, but I think we need to bring this back a little bit and think about what can we do to actually um, either make recommendations to other CNCF projects is my guess around, is there a standard we can either use or create or modify something existing that is easy to implement. It has that sort of cheap cost um, and is automatable for those who want to do that. Does that sound proximate or am I? Off the field. No, I hear you. Uh, I think the CNCF's already engaged in risk management, um, but I don't know that they want to inform anyone else, that's for sure. But really, I was just shooting the breeze, right? Like, 
what the ultimate impact or loss will be is oh hugely totally agree with you yeah it's, a, yeah, it's an interesting postulate you know yeah risk is in there i mean the reason i wanted to bring it up with this group is and correct me if i'm wrong about this but there's a de facto pressure is not the right word uh instinct for cncf to cannibalize its own projects that, that's a good thing if the projects are good you know use the authentication tool that's in there uh you know use the the audit tool, use the red team tool that's already in the landscape, right? That's sort of an implied, uh, you know, if you're, that's an implied coming to the party thing. But what that says, I think about security is the probability then of infecting, you know, across the landscape with reused compromised components is greater in the CNCF than in many other organizations where you know, some of it is outsourced, some of it is built in-house using internal DevOps practices. So, but here we have this sort of open source Uber Alice kind of uh, instinct. Am I, am I wrong about that? No, you're right. I, I think there's a lot 100%. of- 100%. There's still a lot of diversity in open source. I don't think there's like, I think there's a lot of different choices made by different CNCF projects and I don't think it's as uniform as that. I think there are um, more good open source choices you can make potentially than closed source ones in many cases. I mean, there are more, probably more choices with closed source, but not all of them are necessarily good. And you at least get the opportunity to make a better informed decision. I mean, I guess Kubernetes is the, the obvious thing to call out in this, right? Is there something that we can add or integrate into the security assessments that we're currently doing to either increase visibility and awareness of how these things can happen or to help teams think more about how to prepare to potentially address this or mitigate it either by providing uh, end users with a behavior signature of their projects so like when it's deployed, this is what it should be doing and looking like and having that separate from the actual build and release. Um, or is there is there something that we're already doing and we just we haven't reached enough saturation within the landscape? I think Emily, you took the words out of my mouth. I mean, I was it, I came back to uh, what can we do, right? And one thing that we can do is the assessment framework. And in the assessment framework, uh, call out uh, uh, very explicitly these best practices, right? Uh, and um, and that's one of the things that I, I think I had raised when I participated in a couple of assessments where we're calling out a few things and a lot of those projects uh, had done their own pen testing and assessments and that's what they provided. Uh, but uh, we were had no way of evaluating a particular control, if you will, or a particular uh, recommendation or something. So maybe if we added some sense of, for every single project that goes through the SIG security assessment, that we can categorically say we've evaluated against these controls, these, and we've also, it's also been actually, how do you say, evaluated against that control. But we've always provided that and it's just been a discussion, but we've never had the, and, and please for your, correct me, anybody correct me if I'm wrong, but we've never had the feedback to come through to say, yes, we've gone ahead and checked to make sure that, you know, we handle secrets. There are encryption keys and, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, does that make sense or did I just go off on a ramble? So Vinay, I just wanted to offer some thoughts. I think having, you know, any kind of a, a, a way of assessing security is a good thing. Uh, but many times, if we start to fall back to a manual way of doing this, then it doesn't scale. So whatever yes. approach we end up taking has to be automatable. So if, for example, we're going to check in on secrets management, specifically, what are we going to check in? And, and I think it's going to help to us to, to kind of drill down on what are the key things. And we can build this over time, but just get the ball rolling. And iteratively, if we can tighten this a little bit, I think would be kind of the approach to take. Yes, uh, uh, that's a good point. I mean, nothing is manual. I completely agree. Absolutely. Well, oh, one good. thought here was uh, if, if comparing like the CNCF projects versus uh, individual projects managed by one person, generally 
the overall sense is i have i have more confidence um, on cncf project security because of the process involved from sandbox to graduation security assessments done by the group here um, but it's sometimes uh, uh, not a zero to 100% uh, i mean zero or one uh, boolean decision so maybe in the assessments i don't know if it's already done we should mention few things that we haven't assessed for so we generally share that this is in scope i would imagine but sometimes maybe it is worth saying that supply chain security was not in scope of this assessment so that when people are not blindly trusting that the assessment was complete uh, versus uh, knowing that okay this was not in scope so we need to do our own due diligence for it. So we have a couple of those things documented that are needed to be done in the in the updates. So for anyone that's not familiar, I'm going to do another plug here for Brandon. The security assessment process that's performed by the SIG is currently undergoing some changes based off of feedback from the last five assessments that we did, as well as some uh, community involvement and some of the other things that we've noticed over time while working through these assessments. So there is at least one PR out that has a recommendation for like new documentation that better aligns with the current um, talk phases for CNCF, um, either sandbox incubation um, and graduation, as well as uh, there's an updates one coming out, there's benefits associated, like, so explaining to project teams, what, what are they going to get out of it when they're coming to us and we're asking them for all of this information and what, do, what do their end users get out of it. So there are plenty of issues um, on making these updates. Um, check them out in the repo. There's actually a security assessment label, I believe, that you can click on. Um, so if you have ideas, definitely add them to those issues. I think some of what we had talked about in that working group is a lot of these things. Um, from my perspective, I'm not sure entirely how much of it is we're going to be evaluating teams against a standard, so to speak, or against um, best practices, so much as providing them educational information about like, these are the things that they really should be focusing on. This is where they should be paying more attention. Because realistically, if they're not a security project, they're probably not thinking about it in the forefront of their mind. And we've to date really done closer looks at the security projects, like with Spiffy and Spire's assessment and in Toto is looking at them from a supply chain, but not all projects are security minded. They're not security focused. And we'd like to be able to help them out in that area so that the entire landscape becomes more secure. But how does that look? What are, what are, what are we in, what are we going to be on the hook for providing in, in terms of education and documentation? This one specifically with software supply chain based, right? And so that's, I mean, that's obviously the low hanging fruit aspect or no, somebody's nodding no on this so i just want to make sure i'm no it's it's not the only software supply chain. Was, this was... is this is where it started right got it, but got it. like my my whole point like you cannot solve this problem with right. only one thing and back to emily's point uh we have multiple projects in uh cncf right but some of them might not be there but if you think about this problem holistically like who like here has everything, all tools to be able to protect and detect this. Uh, but I can openly say that we don't. And this is like why we're looking into this problem. Like what are the tools here? That's, why, that's that why I prefaced it with that. I'm sorry to interrupt it. Like that's why I prefaced the whole that's part of it. Like is that the initial part of the software supply chain? There's obviously runtime, you know, capabilities. There's things you need to do at a node level. I mean, I think we're all in agreement. It's it's not just one one thing, but it's basically, like I said, some type of standard, which I think Emily, you, I think you're, you know, also kind of alluded to as well it's some type of base standard we can say here here you are these are kind of what you should be doing for each of the projects we do that somewhat with the assessments there should be almost a playbook as well post that says okay going forward because people's like okay i just escaped this assessment cool i'm signed off then what happens is a year later something like this happens and they're like well you know i don't have this set of like list of things that i need to do in my world Right. So that's what I think is is probably missing is some type of at least ongoing, you know, process for those types of things. And I'm sorry to cut you off, Eli. 
No, 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 no worries. Uh, just to just to finish my thought, I, I think that's a, that's a good idea to have users example like, hey, this this is what happened. This is what we know, and this is what you probably should be doing. And these are the tools that would be able to uh, not completely solve this problem, but have a certain mitigation to prevent this. Or if if it's not if you cannot prevent this and how you probably can detect this. And this would also help like uh, polish and landscape and find out what, what gaps we have and what tools we need and what which projects that might not be in there that we need to engage with. And I think now, to a certain extent, the core infrastructure best practices batch uh, does measure for a number of these things. And it's something we look for in the assessments we require projects to attain the best practices batch, if not the silver. It's also something that the TOC looks for the promotion of any project from like intake or promotion from one state to the other. Assessments by nature, there's like a lot of variables, not many things are constant, but like one thing we've come to is like, hey, how, how are you managing secrets? How are you managing rotation of keys? Uh, I know Justin was very uh, diligent in asking, well, you're, you're using tough, great. We cannot just check box and like give you passing callers for this thing. How is tough actually being used? Like what version of tough? How does this interact with, with all those different things? And that does uh, demand a lot of like, well, taking a closer look at these things, but like for starters, if we extend either the CII best practices or we do like a security best practices batch, we could measure for like at least common denominator things uh, that should be in there. And just forming a thought around that. I want to put that there, like think it. I like that a, a lot. Yeah, I like that a lot. And uh, are the CII batch kind of, if we were to, how amenable would it be for us to come up? Of course, this is, uh, and this goes to Altaz's point, which is all fully automated, but how um, costly, both from resources and all those kinds of things, would it be for us to come up with? Here are the 10 security checks, and then we give that badge. It's like security checked badge for a lot of these projects and a constant review, which goes back to Chase's point, which is 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 and a regular assessment. Is that a too high a bar? I think so, because um, it is not one time thing. Again, you have to do yearly reviews or periodic reviews of those products and recertify them as well, because new threats will come and new vulnerabilities. Who's going to keep up? all the updates to them, that becomes it, quite challenging. It's almost like a certification. And again, it might mean more work for us, but I'm just thinking in general, like there's an assessment that you do to get a project over the hill, right? And then there's a, you know, when you cert for a CKA, CKS or any of these things, another two years or three years, you have to research. I almost feel like that needs to happen. But then also we need, again, I mentioned this playbook. It's not like something you drop off and say, go. It's like, look, there's a link to the best practices that SIG Security has that you need to put in place from, your supply chain, from your runtime, from your whatever it might be, uh, you know, that they can refer to. And, you know, again, it doesn't absolve SIG security from all this, but at the very least, it gives like the, these best practices. I believe that's help, more helpful than what's in place now. So is that something what? there's an appetite for to expand from the white paper on? So the white paper was intentionally intended to be like the my first cloud native security architecture kit. How do we take that concept and break it down even further to more concrete actions that we want to see projects and in and entire architectures take when they're looking across the ecosystem at what's going to be their orchestrator, what's going to be responsible for their service mesh, how are they managing identity? I think that's a great, um, great starting point. I think we can um, expand from the paper, but there'll be lots of offshoots, right? Where we write individual detailed um, documents providing guidance just for supply chain, uh, open source software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but we should map that out first uh, as to what that offshoot uh, will look like. And then from there, we can start developing those best practices. The other thing I want to inject in the conversation, and I don't have an answer, this is going to betray my Department of Defense history, uh, but a tool like SolarWinds is a force multiplier. If you look at the CNCF landscape, these are not all equal threats, right? 
certain tools that are uh, highly scalable or are interpenetrated in the network, you know, have differential kind of risks and, and threats. So I know we, we try to, and I've seen some of this in the assessments, we ask the sponsors to talk about, you know, worst case scenarios uh, and impact of that, but maybe we could do something more formal around that. I think we probably could. One of the one of the original intentions behind the white paper was not to get into a lot of detail, but be able to create additional documentation um, or content around the white paper for specific areas. Like the reason why we didn't fully expand on supply expand supply chain security is because it's such a large area with such a huge impact and potential repercussion that it really needed its own. Um, audience, its own kind of outline. Yeah, well put. Like it needs its own sub community for assessment, you mean? Yeah. I, I think it's a, a highly nuanced conversation because, well, even, even if we go like the, the badging route, and if you look at the badge app, there's a projects that achieve the gold standard, and that's the Linux kernel and the update framework. And that does not mean that this things cannot deploy in like suboptimal ways. Now, if, if we look at SolarWinds and like, well, it's, it's unfortunate and like the response at this point may be like, hey, let's shut down every single instance of, of SolarWinds. An attacker can actually have anticipated that and they're going to conduct the, an advanced persistent threat monitoring has been shut off organization wide now like they may be employing a bunch of other things like attacking like weaker points that are like things that don't meet this gold standard or, or don't do this thing so while we could look for things of well the, in the development and maintenance of this project maintainers are doing the right thing like this is how they're signing release this is like how many keys are out there, who can sign a release. All of those checks are good, but there's like, that's the theory in practice. There's there's a lot of deviations that may exist. So do we contemplate those things in scope? We don't and just say, hey, we're, we're making like this uh, attestation of like things have been done right and, and the delivery, but once, once things are running in prod, like there are all these deviations that may have occurred. Are they discrepancies between like intent and implementation that's non-zero? Don't know. But. So I kind of get the sense that the conversation is steering towards establishing a set of controls and I would caution us in going down that path. Uh, we don't want to slow things down. Uh, we want to be enablers of, of kind of the, the innovation that's already taking place, right? Um, and there are different projects that have different groups, different sizes, different levels of maturity. Um, could we, for example, um, you know, provide um, code that has already been uh, through this process and say, look, here's something you can reuse as an example, right? But these are ways to help accelerate rather than, you know, forcing this down and saying, you can't move forward unless control, control, control. Just, it, it hasn't worked in the industry. It's just, it's security getting in the way, essentially. Anyway, uh, others are welcome to chime in, thanks. I think that's why Emily calls it education. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, we're in another, another meeting about talking about CNCF as a third party. And uh, this was the professor at Indiana University. And he said, you know, CNCF has been successful when you compare it to the grid community, which you rewind the clock five or 10 years. We're trying to do a similar kind of thing with the grid. And it failed because there were too many controls placed on the projects. And Sort of the loose reins model of CNCF is part of the so far, part of the secret sauce here. So maybe Altez is getting at, you know, the the need to I guess keep that secret sauce working and yet um, provide projects with things that are enablers to do this. I, I don't have all the answers either, but it's sometimes you've got to make this conversation happen when it's uh, you know front of mind, and this is one of those moments. Yeah, 
if there's a situation too, one of the things is if they're starting out and they have that white paper as an example and they're embedding their security in there from the start, I think that's also useful, right? So I think again, the SIG security's role in that is basically making sure that from the start, if there's a new project coming in, they already think about these things. Cause what are they, what are they doing right now? They're like, I need to get my code out there so people can buy my product or, you know, or, or use my thing, you know what I mean? So at the end of the day, those are the things that are going to be the priorities for them. And if we can kind of say, look, it's not going to impact you. It's just, just think of these things, you know, circulate your keys, you know, uh, you know make sure that your AWS instances or whatever are really locked down. So, you know, you, you can just do those things. I mean, that, that I think is, we would be doing a service to the, the end users by doing it that way. I just want to share my screen as, as we talk through this, because like CII best practices does make all these recommendations and it's not, it's not putting a barrier or hindering people, discouraging people from like developing and open sourcing software is like, Hey, keep doing what you're doing. Come in here, uh, say whether you met or unmet something and like, what's, what's your progression towards that? As opposed to like a lot of people see the assessment as as the checkbox thing, like oh this got us on to like incubation, but a few exceptions. I I, I want to call out Opa. They've done a great job and gone back and said, hey, we actually followed up in the recommendation and are working towards say a silver batch. Uh, some projects may do it because well it's going to get asked again in order to graduate. Some others may just do it because they care about it and they want to improve these things, but yeah, secure release, uh, what artifacts are performed. If you could go to gold, like the requirements are more stringent. What are the cryptographic practices and used? Is it like delivery secured against man in the middle attacks? I wonder if we should like promote this more and like incentivize it and encourage it somehow. If this is the first time I'm even aware of this. Right. You know what I mean? Like as a project that's, you know, anyway, part of a project. Right. So like, I, I think the awareness here, again, I'm sorry for cutting you off there, but like, I, I think an awareness of this would be amazing because I had no idea this was even available. I like it. Uh, I think if we can build on this and look for ways to automate it. It is, yeah, it is actually not automated. There's no conformance tests of this. Essentially, a, a project person comes in and works through this list and they self-certify, hey, do we meet, do we not meet this, uh, and provide some evidence for it. But it it's like checks for those things and it outputs the score, but no one is actually coming in like no human or machine corroborating that that is indeed true. And how often is this uh, updated? Are they, do they have a requirement to come and keep it fresh? So I wanna answer no. In my personal experience, I, I filled out the one for Spiffy Inspire. Uh, when we were working uh, to move from when we made a proposal to hey we're ready for incubation uh, one thing we do is we actually put this on the we have the, the little batch on the project readme so it says whether it's passing i think we're like 198 percent towards the silver batch let me get the zoom out of the way and yeah i have gone back and like we have one standing item on on one of the categories that we're working towards but it, it, it has also given the project a a guideline of hey the, it actually helped us clean up and organize a lot as we were working through these things of what could we improve and where should we be doing better? And if not, well, what, why is that? What are those sharp edges? What were the trade-offs that led to that decision being made? But it, it helped, it helped us and helped other people. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are not, not aware that this thing like exists or, or projects go through it. 
So I want to yeah. kind of like circle back because we've, we've talked about a lot of stuff and we've got 12 more minutes left. I know you guys all want to be here all day, but so I've heard that potentially creating libraries or even role sets or policies for teams to either enable some sort of automated detection that they're doing better, that they're being more secure in their practices or that they're meeting CII badging um, criteria. I've heard the retrospective on the white paper and just in this conversation alone sounds like there's a lot more work that could potentially be done there as well as more updates to the security assessments that we're currently doing, the PRs that are already out there for it and the open issues. Those are like the three primary things that I'm, I'm hearing for how we can help educate the community better to do better and just kind of strive for more secure projects. Did I miss another like potential action? There's two things there. There's, there's the areas we need to educate in. Um, I think the other part which is sort of interesting which will come from that retrospective is how do we go about doing that education? Um, is a 40 page white paper targeted towards CISOs going to be the best way to, to get some of those points across? Or is it more like that checklist we're showing? Or I think that's something that's worth sort of considering in there as well. I think a sandwich model is always good. You start from the bottom and the top down and you eat in the middle. So if it has to come from the CISOs as well as community or grassroots driven efforts, definitely we could potentially look at that from an education opportunity. And uh, maybe the other one was the current topic, right, Emily, which was, is there anything that we can do? Uh, should we open a PR to just start collating all these great ideas, right, which is uh, from a CII best practices, uh, like a security best practices, and maybe pull in a lot of the security assessment framework to actually make it, uh, and, and maybe Brandon is already on top of that, to actually have it rendered somewhere where we can actually look and feel, and that's a great first step, and then we start to see how we can put potentially automated and have projects. I love this framework. I mean, and to provide a security framework in the same vein would be incredibly invaluable. And that satisfies education, that satisfies assessment, evaluation, and then we can also keep it a, a little bit more lively as we mature. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think I would like to see it, uh, a lot of folks sign up for that retro with the white paper to kind of help drive more of this educational conversation. Um, I would also like to see folks take a look at the current security assessment improvement issues as well as the PRs that are associated with them. I think we only have like 11 PRs in the repo right now, so there's not that many to go through. Just to evaluate with the current recommendations from the working group, are they still sound and how do we improve them? And then for the other bits that we don't actually have projects in flight for, maybe create an issue to evaluate the, the outfall of the solar winds event. How do we do a better job of increasing awareness for the community, whether or not that's through talking to them about it, do, uh, instituting checks within our own processes, or even creating those libraries um, for teams to be able to pull in? Yep, makes sense. It's a good, like, I didn't know it was called the sandwich model. Well, I'm calling it the sandwich model. There's probably a much better term for it. That's good, top down and bottom up at the same time. That's a great instinct I have too. I, I was just gonna add to this, uh, I'll put it in the chat. The building scenarios is one way to get at and some simulations or um, you could do this with red team, virtual red teaming also, but uh, to identify these force multiplier scenarios like compromising VMware, uh, you know, the thing that fires up uh, instances of containers, these are places where if you do an inject, you can scale the risk rapidly. And people may not, you know, think of those unless they're forced into, you know, sort of iterating through the scenarios. So I don't know where that fits into your taxonomy, but that should be on the list, I think. Agreed. So who's going to make the issue to uh, capture all the little tiny tidbits for projects we don't currently have in flight? I can, Emily. I'll take a stab. <laughs> that would be great, Vinny. Thank you. Sure. Vinny, I can help you if you need help. Yeah, I'll, uh, but maybe I'll, let's, yeah, I'll reach out. Uh, thank you. No worries. 
I would underline Mark's Mark's point, not to not to regress back to the conversation, but S scenarios are extremely important. Like a lot of the assessments focus on on software, as is in the repository, not so much as in runtime and, and all the possible different ways that people deploy things. Agreed. Good chat. This is a great community for this. Hey. Yeah, and then, then how do we gamify it at all of like sandwich model or not like how many carrots versus how many sticks is the right combo? Agreed. So we've got seven minutes left. Does anybody have any final thoughts on this topic? It's job security. I feel like everything in security is job security. All right, are there any other topics uh, that somebody wanted to talk about with the last six minutes that I might have missed inadvertently? Well, one of the topics from last time wanted to just give a update there. Uh, Brandon and I were discussing about how CNCF's landscape and cloud native security landscape are not really related to each other, even though they sound very similar. So I have been thinking about would, would it be a good idea to potentially rename cloud native security landscape to something else? So I, I have some ideas. I'll post it on Slack. Maybe if people could vote uh, and we could probably choose a better uh, terminology that clarifies that those two are not related. Um, maybe we would have something there. So everyone's gonna jump in the Slack channel and vote. Yes. And I'm going to see a whole lot more traffic on our issues and our PRs from the community today, right? <laughs> okay. Um, if there isn't anything else, I will give everybody back five minutes of their day. Can you pin that vote in the channel so I can find it? That was all. Sorry for talking about you. Thank you. I agree. If I have access to pin, I'll pin it. Otherwise, I'll let the maybe Emily or Brandon pin it. I'm glad I'm not the only one who can't find stuff on Slack. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining another awesome SIG meeting. I look forward to seeing you guys. I believe, are we meeting next week? Is that right? We certainly have an agenda for it. All right. We will see you all next week. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.